everyone. This is Steve Marinucci, freelance writer for Variety and Billboard and Goldmine and Access.com and author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones, welcoming you to another session of Things We Said Today, our weekly discussion of what's happening in the Beatle world, past, present, and to come. Let me introduce my two cohorts on the other side of the country. Um, first in the beautiful state of Maine, um, the author of Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, which is, in my estimation, and I uh, I have to say my name's in the book, but it is one of the best analyses of the Beatles music that uh, that's out there, Mr. Alan Closen. Hello, hey. Alan. Hey, Steve. Thank you. And hello, everyone. <laughs> I had to qualify that a little bit, but yes, <laughs> but yes. And also, um, in the great state of Connecticut, um, which I drove through many times on my way from Massachusetts to New York, and didn't stop very often, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> is the host of the uh, Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, Mr. Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hi, Steve. Hi, everybody. Today we're going to we're going to have a little discussion. We just passed the 60th anniversary of the meeting of John Lennon and Paul McCartney. We're going to talk about that, but we're going to talk about some topical stuff first. And the first topical thing we're going to talk about is the opening of Paul McCartney's tour, um, which happened last week, and and he's playing another show tonight as we uh, getting ready to do another show tonight. Uh, this is the 10th, and. I guess we should be should not be surprised that there hasn't been any changes. I mean, he, they, they, I was just looking over the set list for Japan, the last show, and he had Junior's Farm, but he didn't pull that over to uh, America. I mean, everything here is is ordinary. I mean, they didn't do anything really special. And what can you say? I mean, there isn't a whole lot you can say. Um, uh, Alan. Well, yeah, I mean, there's <laughs> there's that. I mean, I guess you might expect the set list to change a bit, you know, more than it does. But his set list always changes very slowly. And um, I suppose it's possible, I mean, if you want to be hopeful, that um, just because it didn't change at the very start of the tour doesn't mean that somewhere during the tour he might switch a few songs out. But, I mean, that right. doesn't happen that much. But uh, I've, I've heard, you know, some clips. Um, I try to keep tabs on these shows, you know, to the extent that I can. Um, and usually people are out there putting the whole show up on various sites uh, within a mm. few days. I haven't got a whole show yet, but there are quite a few clips uh, from Miami. And, um, you know, it's pretty much what we've been hearing. I mean, I suppose as a, as a um, you know, masochistic exercise, I began with uh, Maybe I'm Amazed. Um, <laughs> just to see whether, you know, I mean, that is a, it, it may very well be the hardest thing he sings in some ways. Maybe not, but it, it, it does seem to tax his voice a lot and um, right. you know he hasn't brought it down in key or anything like that and so you know it's it sounds like the way it's been sounding and i don't know i i just i really have mixed feelings about it because it's on one hand it's not great singing um by the typical paul mccartney standard we've been used to for decades and yet there's still I gotta say there's there's still something exciting about watching the clip, you know, and and seeing him do it, hearing the audience go for it and uh so there it is. It, I mean it is one of his uh his best songs. Uh, I think if there's a, a list of top ten solo songs, I think that has to be on it. And, yeah. and you know, it, I mean, just chord wise and and the way he's all you know, emotion wise, the way he he did it uh, on record and the way he's done it in the past. I mean, it, it is a great song. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, I mean, more you know, more on the set list though. Assuming that. As we were talking about a couple of weeks ago about the CD getting released whenever it gets released, maybe he'll incorporate some of the songs after it gets released. And I suspect, because that's what he did with New, he didn't, as I recall, he didn't play anything from New beforehand. It was always after. Right. So I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't expect him to to do that. I mean, that would be exciting for sure. him to do that. To do that. But I don't know. Maybe he maybe he will this time. Maybe he'll he'll 
you know, he'll see that that would have gotten people more interested, you know. Who knows? I, I hope. I kind of wish it would. You know, that that kind of thing can go both ways. Um, mm-hmm. I know that, uh, you know, right before Led Zeppelin 3 came out, I saw them at Madison Square Garden, <laughs> and they played um, Since I've Been Loving You from the album, which, you know, none of us had ever heard before, and it mm-hmm. was incredible. And seeing as I accidentally taped it, I had that tape to listen to for <laughs> – for like three weeks until the album came out. And I got to say, when the album came out, I was so disappointed because the studio version was incredibly wimpy by comparison with the way they really? played it. Yes. Huh. And, you know, so maybe he doesn't want to set up that kind of comparison or maybe he doesn't want tracks to be bootlegged, you know, passed around before the actual album comes out. Now, that is a major concern. I mean, it wasn't back then with yeah. Led Zeppelin. but now <laughs> if he does something like that it'll be on the internet all over the place the next within hours yeah you know so yeah i mean you know I, uh, look I, the, go ahead ken i would hope that he shouldn't even care about that because you know all it does is generate more publicity yeah. around him if he has a new song out and that's the name of the game Right. You Look know. what happened with the with the uh, song from what was it Ethel and uh, I can't remember the that movie that he had had that song and the kind of in the blink of an eye in the blink of an eye. Yeah, I mean that was on the internet within you know within minutes almost, mm. you know? and so yeah, same difference. But uh, yeah, well let's let's just uh, uh, you know we'll hope for something. Ken, what do you want to say about set, set list? Anything? Well, you know, in my case, I'm very disappointed, and I know that people who have followed what I've said, for me, from tour to tour, the most exciting things are the new songs that he has that maybe he's never done before. Uh, When I say new, I don't necessarily mean his brand new songs. I mean anything from his catalog, or any songs that he hasn't done for a long time, like I was thrilled when he brought back High, High, High into Mm -hmm. his set list, or Venus and Mars Rock Show, you know, when he did that a few years ago. He did Junior's yeah. Farm in Tokyo. And, right. and I don't think he hasn't done that here in a while, as I recall. And that even that would have been cool. And he and he left it off. Now, yeah. Well, he did it last year in America. Did he? Okay. Yeah. I, I, he did I don't know. I, I don't remember. But but that's the exciting thing for me. The thing is, you hear because Paul gives so many interviews. There was an interview he gave not long ago where he was talking about the possibility. He was thinking about adding a song from Flowers in the Dirt because of the mm-hmm. remaster, it would have been so nice for him to do anything from that, even My Brave Face, you know, something as obvious as that. But it's just so slow going with him. You he's know, very, just, it's very rare when he does that. I mean, very. I mean, he's had multiple opportunities to promote things like that. And he and he hasn't. I mean, even the, even I, I, I benefit of Mr. Kite was in the set uh, in Miami, and that's always that's it's that's not a new addition. That's been there, right? You know, so you know, it's just you know, I don't know. I, it, I don't know what the thinking is. Or, you know, and I don't want to speculate. On, yeah, on the one hand, the way I see it, he's got to me the greatest catalog of all time between the Beatles and his solo stuff. He's got an embarrassment of riches to pick from. And he still, you know, there are certain core songs that he feels he has to do, where he thinks that the public will be very upset if he doesn't do Let It Be, Hey Jude, Ben on the right. Run, Live and Let Die. But it's all those other songs that make it interesting for me. But then again, I'm spoiled. I've lived in the New York area. I've seen him many times. Think about people who have never seen him or haven't seen him for a long time. Think about, God bless him, all these people in Australia that have been waiting for him since 1993. They're probably not going to be that fussy as we are. So, you know, think about the general public who know him mainly for the Beatles stuff and a handful of signature songs like Ben on the Run from his solo career that will be very happy with this. He's catering to that crowd. He makes very few changes. So, um... To people like us who have studied that catalog, who know it very well, and you wish he'd go deep once in a while. I mean, he made a big deal out of saying that um, he added temporary secretary recently. Mm -hmm. You know, for him, that's taking a chance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When you think about all the great songs, even hits from his solo career that he's never done live, there's so many of them still. And 
he just I don't know he he makes very few changes and it's uh, I I wish that he would show more pride in his catalog his full catalog. I don't know that it's I don't know if it's a question of pride. I think there's there's probably something a little more mundane. I guess is the word, but you know I don't know. Uh, it, it's it's again that's like like I said. I don't want to speculate. I don't want to play pundit on something like this. I mean, hopefully he'll. We'll see some changes. I know we will. But the question is, you know, it'd be nice to, like you say, dig into uh, uh, some corners and, and pull some stuff out. So, yep. we'll see what happens. Yep. And the 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 uh, the other thing we wanted to mention was um, our condolences over the passing of Joel Glazier, who passed away um, July seventh. For those of you that don't know who Joel Glazier is. He was um, an expert on the Paul is Dead phenomenon. I guess you could call it a phenomenon or idea or whatever. Um, but I, I never, now I never heard him speak, and I can't remember, to be honest, if I interviewed him. I don't think I interviewed him when I did my Paul is Dead story several years ago. Um, Alan, do you ever talk to him? No, I never did. Um, Can you? No, but I'm, I'm certainly impressed with. All that I've read about him since since his passing, and the fact mm-hmm. that he he was a lecturer at uh, fifty states <laughs> in the United States to talk about the Paul is dead rumor, and, you know, and, so. and in and in England, he he did it in Liverpool too. So yeah, well, which must have been. And in fact, I'm reading I'm reading um, a, a story here from the Newark Post from 2012, and he actually gave it in front of Paul McCartney's cousin. <laughs> yeah. uh, which must have been must have been interesting, you know, for him to get her reaction uh, after after that. But uh, you know, I don't know. But um, yeah, he, he also he, had a lot to do with the the John Lennon Peace Forest right. in Israel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So right, right, and and also Amnesty International. I know mm-hmm. we got a we got a note from Tom Frangione last Friday uh, who who broke the word to us, and uh, there's a. There's an obituary on, uh, obituary on I think it's uh, legacy.com. Yeah, legacy.com for uh, of him. But he passed away from cancer. So our condolences to the family. Mm-hmm. Um, um, what can we say? Um, okay, now on to another piece of news. Um, Ringo Starr celebrated his 77th birthday with a peace and love event in Los Angeles. With uh, a little help from a lot of friends, and he gave. I know they. If you watch the video, they were throwing things at the crowd. Joe Walsh was was throwing them, and Ringo said Joe likes to throw things. They were throwing peace and love bracelets, of which I have one on, and peace and love cookies, I believe. Uh, uh, I was told. So, anyway, um, but yeah, they they had music. Uh, Jenny Lewis was one of the performers. So was Van Dyke Parks, as we mentioned last week. Um, and but also on the day of his birthday, he broke the news about the release of his new album, Give More Love, which will be out on September fifteenth. September fifteenth. Yeah, I had to pull out my my notes here, um, and it's got uh, a bunch of tracks uh, written or co-written by Ringo. Fourteen. And the, Fourteen, if you include the bonuses, you know. I mean, even as we are speaking, um, just three seconds ago, I got an email from Universal that has downloads of the tracks. Yeah, I got so. I got that too. So I yeah, you know, wow. it's so frustrating. We we're here talking about this, and here it is, unlistened to. Yeah, mm. yep, undownloaded even. Cover looks yep. nice. The cover is Ringo standing against. Um, you know, Ringo in his glasses and his, you know, sort of looks like a leather jacket. And the wall, it says Ringo, give more love in red with uh, the O of love is the peace symbol. And then in black on the rest of the wall, which is white, um, it you know, it has lots of give more love written all over it in different ways, you know, vertical, mm-hmm. horizontal, kind of a nice looking cover. I have in front of me, in case you are interested, the credits for the album. Um, yes, in fact, you posted it. You did a whole article. On no, it. but I didn't post the the. I have the the session, 
the session players. I think I mentioned the some of them. Did I put most of the thing? I don't remember. But yes, you did. I mean, oh, okay, because <laughs> uh, uh, there's a lot of people on here. As not not surprisingly, uh, Tim Timothy Schmidt, uh, Steve Lukather, of course, Paul McCartney on "Show Me the Way," uh, and uh, we're on the road again. Yeah, that was a surprise in a way because I thought that Paul was on one song, and it turns out he's on two. Yeah, I didn't. I just noticed that myself. Okay, and he's so, but he's only vocalizing on the one song, only on "We're on the Road Again." And uh, let's see who else: uh, Joe, uh, Don Was, Ben Montench, Glenn Ballard, Steve Dudas, Gary Nicholson, Edgar Winter. Um, I thought Sheila E was going to be on this, but she's not. So, um, Greg Bissonnet, who else? I'm looking. I'm looking down the list here very quickly, and of course on the the bonus tracks, uh, uh, Vanderveer uh, is on. Uh, is sings with him on photograph and don't pass me by. Uh, and you should say that the reason why they're on this album is because last year when he had his peace and love party, this band Vanderveer performed uh, live. I think those two songs, right? And, so, and Alberta, Alberta Cross also performed "You Can't Fight Lightning," and that's and she right. sings with him, and mm-hmm. then he he redoes he redoes "Back Off Boogaloo," and according to the the press information, he found the original recording. I assume that means the demo of "Back Off Boogaloo," mm. um, so and that's where that comes from. So or that's and, what. And don't pass you know, me by us like, on here again. Don't right, yeah. that's with Vanderveer. That's with yeah. yeah, that's Ringo and Vanderveer. Oh right. Okay. So that's, that's the be, first it, time he's covered that song. I mean, mm-hmm. he's done it live, but as far as a cover, a studio cover, it's the first time he's done that. Is it? I'm trying to. Yeah. I seem to think he's done it. He, well, he's no. At, okay. No, right. he did. Love me do. Maybe well, you're thinking gotten, about that. He's gotten into you know doing redoing tracks. Oh with yeah, a couple of albums. So with uh, Wings, he redid. Right, but and, he's released. Uh, he, he's released. Give more love, and we've all heard it. Do um, you guys want to comment? It sounds a lot <laughs> like. <laughs> it sounds a lot like a lot of other um, post. Right. You know, time takes time. Sort of era Ringo. I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, you know what? I don't know that that necessarily should sound as negative as it does. I mean, when we listen to a George Harrison track, we hear certain thumbprints of the way George writes, the way he plays slide guitar, Mm -hmm. the kinds of melodies he uses. And we hear them now in this with Ringo. You know, it sounds like like some of the songs he's been doing since about 89 or so. And Mm -hmm. it's it's just his... uh, you know what? It's what he does. He's not out there trying to sort of be an avant-garde recreator of the pop song structure. You know, um, he's, right? He does what he does. He does what he likes, and there it is. You know, it's, it sounded like a pleasant, pleasant enough song. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's not breaking any ground musically, but you know, it's what. It, it, like you say, it's it's what he does. So, Remember that, like early yeah. on when he started touring, he used to say, "You know, I'm not here to break anybody's brains." <laughs> and this is he sort said of that? yes. I don't remember him saying. I don't yeah. remember him saying. That. I remember. Him, I remember him? saying that. I, I remember saying it more than once. You know, um, and and I think what he meant was, you know, I'm just going out to have some fun, play songs I like, and that's what it is. And and this is right. sort of like it's not going to break anyone's brains either. Oh. Right, and I mean it's, it's it goes along with his peace and love, yeah. you know, peace and love theme, uh, you know, that he, you know, that he spilled during the uh, the birthday celebration, and you know, which is all he, you know, every time time you see him, he's got his, you know, he's he's doing the peace and love thing. So, yeah. but I kind of think that it sounds closer to his post Mark Hudson stuff, you know, from Why Not on, you know, two thousand twelve. Postcards from Paradise. It fits in that mold, hmm. and in a way, I also think that melodically, it kind of reminds me quite a lot of Never Without You. Mm-hmm. So, you know, see, I, the first thing I thought of was Choose Love. That was the first thing I thought of. But I'm not hearing uh, that. But that's really, me. no. Okay. I'll try to listen next time with that in mind. Maybe it's because of the words. I don't know. Anyway, so there we go. Um, He is going back out on tour in October. 
October and November for those of you. Actually, he's going all over the country, starting in Las Vegas, going to Texas, Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, Virginia, New Jersey, New York, and New York. Have you got your tickets, Ken? Yes. I've lost count as to how many shows I'm going to. <laughs> okay. My wife handles all that, and she ends up getting tickets for more shows than I ask her to. So, ah. um, But um, I enjoy him every single time I see him and the band. Yeah, he's, he's, I, I will say it's an enjoyable evening when, when uh, you see him. Anyway, okay. Now we <laughs> are on to the topic at hand, which is the... 60th anniversary of the meeting of Paul McCartney and John Lennon, which was last week on July 6th. It's, I, you know, I don't know what to say. I, I mean, when you think about the fact that this meeting happened as it did, the, the, I was surprised to learn, by the way, that the, the actual spot where they met no longer is no longer the hall at the church is not where they actually met. It's because they've. It's a, it's something else now. But it's. I mean, it, the 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 meeting that meeting itself. I mean, from humble beginnings, big things come. I mean, it's mm-hmm. amazing. It's amazing. Mm. You know, uh, Ivan Vaughn apparently was the one that made it happen, and you know the fact that they is a. The uh, quarrymen got back together, or got together last week and, and performed, and they did the the Lori uh, uh, trip uh, like they did on that day with with John in the, in the Lori and with the actual with the with the, the guy who actually drove the Lori. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that was yeah. That, that was a nice that touch. Was, <laughs> yeah, mm. that was a nice touch. Um, I mean, it 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 it's beautiful that they that they were able to do that and in the same location, but it's just the the whole. This meeting, I mean, other some people have called it, and I've seen it referred to as the greatest meeting in rock and roll history. Uh, it's it's hard not to say that, you know, for the for the effect of on musical history. Um, I don't know who could dispute it, but <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'd be hard to uh, it'd be hard to dispute, especially the way it happened. I mean, they did not meet with expectations of really going anywhere i think it was just an audition and you know when paul picked up the guitar and started playing um and john got impressed and and it history was made right there i mean it it happened and it's just it's just incredible it's just incredible yeah well that's that's how history plays out you never Mm -hmm. know when you're making decisions like these where it's going to lead mm-hmm and for that matter, I mean, Paul was asked to join. He didn't join immediately. He said that he had to go to a uh, holiday camp, right? Um, or, or a summer camp with his I, brother. I, yeah, I, be- yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. was really funny was Rod Davison, Rod Davison uh, was, and Len Gary weren't, I don't remember. Uh, or, uh, Rod Davis wasn't there. I'm sorry. I'm looking at my notes. I'm looking at my, the printout of my story from Billboard. Rod Davis was not there. Gary, Len Gary does remember seeing him pick up the guitar, and um, Colin Hanton says he didn't see Paul until after the meeting took place. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it was that kind of an unassuming meeting. You know, it wasn't, there wasn't, you know, because neither of them were well known, and, and it just happened. Yeah, it was uh, sort of like in the downtime in between sets, you know. And- right. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, if you think about the reality of it, 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 it was just a couple of kids meeting, you know, and one of them had a band and one of them also played the guitar. And it was, you know, in reality, completely inauspicious. And, you know, mm-hmm. it's uh, just sort of astonishing, you know, what came of it, really. I mean, and also, you know, you read, you read, Mark Lewison's book, you know, the first volume, um, you know, one of the things that comes through that book is how basically nowhere they were, you know, and, and until like really towards the end of that first book, I mean, close to the end anyway, I mean, you know, from when, once they came back from Hamburg, you know, but it, it, at the time we're talking about when they met, you know, probably if you were going to put your bets on any of the, these guys to become a star, it would have been Ringo. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mm. yeah. 
and and which yeah which brings up the whole thing about Ringo's you know birthday again and and his you know the way things have gone for him um but but yeah it's it's pretty astonishing um Mm, you know, yeah. and they, and they didn't even. And what's even more amazing is the music that they played that day really had little to do with what ended up being the Beatles, because you know they were uh, Quarrymen were basically a, a kind of a skiffle band. Yeah. So, but they were trying yeah. to do some rock too. You know, um, you know the Del Viking song that Paul is always saying that John didn't have the words to. Uh, come go, come with, go me. with me. You know, mm-hmm. down to the penitentiary, kind of making it a blues, and uh, you know, you know what I've always found astonishing about that day is like here is this is just a day, you know, it's just a local church fete, it's just a couple of little guys, but what have we got? We've got a bunch of pictures of the quarrymen playing that day. We don't have pictures of Paul, but you know, it's still that day, so we've got those pictures of John up at the mic, singing, playing his guitar. And then a few, maybe, what is it now, 20-some-odd years ago, we ended up with the recording, you know, that someone had sitting in his attic for decades and finally came out, um, you know, and, and, and sold. I mean, we've only heard a couple of snippets of it, and it sounds awful. But but nevertheless, I mean, it, it's just it just strikes me as odd that, you know, it was – what turned out to be an auspicious day, but you know nobody knew it at the time, and yet there is some audio and pictures of mm-hmm. of, of the quarrymen. And in a way, it's miraculous that we have that. <laughs> yeah, it is. And there's been more, you know, and more pictures have come out in recent years. The picture of, of, on the lorry. I mean, that showed up uh, was it about two years ago for the first time. That was not one. I mean, we've all seen. Everyone's seen the the picture of John on stage wearing the cowboy shirt, which uh, uh, Julia says he I, I guess he had just gotten the the uh, the cowboy shirt Julia Baird, and so but I mean we had not seen the picture we heard about the lorry ride but we had not seen the actual picture until it uh, it surfaced but uh, amazing amazing you know it's funny um in when the uh when the tape turned up and was going to be i think it was auctioned at sotheby's and something's telling me this is like not what 1992 three something like that early 90s mm-hmm. this was when you know i was supposed to be the beatles desk at the times but this mm-hmm. this you know depends on your editor's attitudes you know um, right. towards it. So, you know, I, around the time of, you know, Lewison's recording sessions book and the Russian album, there was an editor there who was really keen on getting anything to do with the Beatles into the paper, which was great and a lot of fun for me. Oh. Um, with this, I, I went to my editors and said, you know, they've just come up with recordings of the Quarrymen playing on the day that John and Paul met in Liverpool and it was, you know, church fan told them the whole thing. And they were totally like I had to keep them awake <laughs> while telling them about wow. this. And uh, you know, they said, "Well, you know, we don't want to be in a position where you know every time one of the Beatles sneezes, that we're there with a handkerchief." And I said, "Oh my! What are you kidding me? Oh my!" So you know, I'm trying to get. I'm writing the story, and they're telling me like I have like 200 words or something. You know, and oh come on! So I'm walking around the newsroom, and I'm picking up a wire photo of the one of the photos of John singing that day, and I run into an assistant managing editor, and. He says, so what's up? And I said, well, you know, it's really interesting. We've got all this stuff from that day. Now recordings have just turned up. And, you know, they're not very listenable. And, you know, but and they're going to be auctioned. And who knows if people will get to hear them generally. But it's kind of odd that, you know, this is the day John and Paul met. And there's a recording of the Quarrymen from that day. So we know what Paul heard. And... um he said, you know, I said, plus we've got this picture. This picture is from exactly the same day, you know. And and he said, well, that's really interesting. And I said, but, you know, they're only going to give me 200 words. <laughs> and he said, I'll tell you what. I'll go around. I'll keep you out of it. I won't. I won't get you in any trouble here. I'll, I'll go around and I'll sort of work it out so that you have some more space. Now, 
to a New York Times editor that translates as this, which is exactly what happened. He went over to my editor. He said, Alan Cozen says he has a story. You won't give him enough words. Give him more words. <laughs> <laughs> How many more words did you get? Um, I probably got it. The whole thing was probably maybe five or 600 words. You know, it, mm. it, it got a little better than I was originally given. I mean, you know, after, after there wasn't an awful lot of information, but, you know, we knew something about whose recorder it was and why it had been lost all this time and and, and all that. And all that stuff is interesting, you know? So, mm. <laughs> so wow. yeah, the way things happen. <laughs> the way things you know, happen. <laughs> just out of curiosity, Alan, have you saved every article you've ever written on the Beatles, oh, or even sure. your classical work, too. I've saved everything, yeah, sure. Oh, good. Hmm. Well, I'd like to read this article from back okay. then. Okay, well, I will. Yeah, oh, actually, I anybody, anybody could go on to nytimes.com and do a search for, um, you know, Cozen, Woolton, Lennon, McCartney, Quarryman, and... You know the article should come up if you know if you do a, a good search, um, okay. and you can read I think what ten articles a month before they ask you to subscribe. So, so if you just keep it to the Beatles articles, that would be <laughs> that would okay. Be fine. I will search it out. Mm -hmm. I have a subscription, so I don't have a ten article limit. Yeah, so me there. either. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I I just I got a subscription a couple months ago. I figured it was about time to support real journalism. <laughs> but mm. in any event, that's my political comment for the day. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, and they they made a they had a, made a big deal about this in Liverpool. They had I know we know. Uh, Jackie Spencer, who who um, does tours over there, she was talking. Uh, she's talking on Facebook about all the tours she did. So, I mean, there was a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, the Cavern did a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I mean, they they d did stuff in cooperation with St. Peter's. So it's really it's really cool. I mean, it's it's great that uh, I found the article, that, by the way. It's July. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find it. My July, July twenty first, ninety four, and the title is John Lennon's first known recording is for sale. So if you search for that, that will that should come up. Okay. And, uh, okay. And you know, one other thing, I remember back when the first time I interviewed Mark Lewison, which was when the Beatles Live came out. I made it a point to bring up this date of July sixth because. For years and years, Beatle books, and if you looked anywhere, encyclopedias, the internet, they'd have um, you know false information about that date. But Mark was the one who who figured out that it was July sixth, nineteen fifty seven. It's so important that to know the right date when it happened. And um, I know I always saw June fifteenth. Well, you know, actually, some, actually, Mark's first first professional job, probably, uh, you know, apart from some things he had written for Beatles Monthly about the the BBC shows, was when he was hired by Philip Norman as a researcher, exactly to find that date. Mm. Because Philip ran into the same problem you just mentioned: the date was never consistent, and I think he knew that. You know, if anybody could find it, it was Mark, who at that point had won a few, you know, Beatles Brain of Europe kind of contests. So he was a logical person to seek out. Yeah. Didn't did we, did we talk about that one with with Philip when he was when he was on? Uh, it seems like we we did. Did we? Mm. I think I think we might have, but in any event, yeah, I just found the article too. So yes, yeah, so it is still available, July twenty first, nineteen ninety four. That long ago. Long ago and far away. And there's a quote from Lewis in it. Mm -hmm. As soon as I heard the tape, it was clear that it was John Lennon, Mr. Lewis, and said yesterday. He was 16 years old, but it was that same distinctive voice. To suddenly come across a tape of an unknown band of teenage musicians playing in a small town 37 years after the fact is almost unbelievable. Nonetheless, this is what we have. It's the holy grail that no one knew existed. Not a bad quote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, not not bad at all. Good quote. Yep. And he does. He does. Uh, I remember putting on the style. Um, he did. A, that was actually a good version. Mm -hmm. So. 
and also they did um, and is it's 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 also on the tape baby let's play house which also you know was a, was a hit for elvis but um has later beatles implications in that uh the first line of um run for your life run for your life <laughs> was pirated right out of baby let's play house i'd rather see you dead little girl than to be with another man mm. right so, amazing yeah. did apple buy that tape I assume they did. I don't know. Either, you know, if Apple didn't, then McCartney must have. I mean, he doesn't. I, I quote the Sotheby's guy, but I don't think he talks about what kind of money they expect for it. Um, he says, when you first hear, this is a, a guy named Stephen Maycock, who at the time was um, in charge of their rock sales. Um, mm-hmm. When you first hear the tape, it sounds rough. It was recorded with a handheld microphone in the worst venue you could want, a church hall with a high ceiling and probably a hard floor. Despite that, it has been stored carefully, and the sound has probably not deteriorated from what it was in 1957. And I've heard a copy that has been cleaned up using modern technology, and the improvement was 100%. I'm not sure we've heard that copy. Still, we're not selling a high-quality recording. Recording, we're selling a recording made on a historic day. So he mm-hmm. right. didn't say how much they expected, and I don't know offhand how much it went for. And it's not, I mean, we've all heard it. It's not the greatest quality, but it's definitely, you can definitely tell it's John. Mm-hmm. So. Cool. Yeah, well, when you're talking about history, sometimes the quality of the audio doesn't matter as much. <laughs> no. Yeah. I mean, it always matters, but, you know, like when we talked about Live at the Star Club. You know, it's still so much a big part of history and all that we have to document, you know, their time in Germany. Yeah. That's yeah. Tony Sheridan and all that, but. Right. I think it's high time that, it, so that a tape of the Beatles at the Cavern sort of turned up. I mean, besides some other guy in Kansas City, we know that there is a full set list someplace. I think uh, Paul McCartney bought it when it came up for auction. So there's at least one tape, but you know, the, God, there's bound to be more, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I would, and yeah, yeah you're right. Uh, somebody, boy, if somebody would ever have a copy of that and put it out on the, you know, for sale, good grief! Wow. You know, it's one thing. Uh, it's shocking to me that we even have this tape from July 6th, but the Beatles in 62 and 63 were gaining popularity, especially in 63 in the UK, you would have thought somebody recorded them at the cavern. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, it's one thing when you're not that famous, when you're the quarryman in 1957, I don't expect anybody to record a thing <laughs> from yeah. that, but <laughs> you would have thought in 62 and 63, you know, somebody must've been there with a reel to reel or. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Probably not the handiest place and the handiest technology, you know, to record them. I mean, you know, if you consider the the circumstances at the cavern for mm-hmm. those shows, uh, you know, you'd need a place to plug in. You you know, uh, and if it, if we're talking about a reel to reel, it would be possibly not the heaviest thing going, but not all that light, and mm. uh, so. You, but yeah, you would think that they would have, you know. They borrowed reel to reels to to practice and listen to themselves. You would think that at some point they'd have encouraged somebody to come down, set it up on stage, set up the mic, and 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 capture their show. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and Lewison's uh, Beatles Live book has a bunch of has the song lists from you know from those years, and some of the songs that they did have not surfaced in any form and there's some remarkable songs i think jailhouse rock was one of them um that comes to mind uh maybe you could, i don't have my um my lewis and uh, my beatles live book uh, in front of me but oh uh, yeah that was the fascinating I'm, part most of all of that book is to see all these song titles of songs that they did at least once and many of them were songs that they didn't even do on bbc radio Mm. So those are the ones, you know, if it's not part of their EMI catalog and it's not part of the BBC catalog, you know, I'd, I'd love to hear any of those songs. Right. And that's what makes the BBC catalog 
so cool and so spectacular is the fact that a lot of those songs that they did on the BBC were stuff that they did live that they hadn't planned to record or they didn't record, you know, and, mm. and so, yeah, uh, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's too, it's too bad. We don't have more of those songs. Cause that would be, that would be fantastic. And that's another reason that the star club, which they apparently, and I still can't believe that they don't recognize the star club tape for the historical, you know, significance that it, that it has, you know, is is has gotten such bad a bad rep with them, you know. Yeah. That they stop stop to put it out. I mean, why? Why? There's no there's no reason for that. I mean, portions of that are just absolutely fantastic. I mean that one bootleg version that came out a couple of years ago where they did a little bit of tweaking on it. I mean it it's not perfect. It's never going to be perfect, but it sounds very listenable. And why they why they put some of the stuff on the first anthology CD and not that is amazing. That rehearsal, the Quarrymen rehearsal rehearsal tape, yeah, is. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but that's. I don't particularly care for that at all. I would much rather hear the Star Club. Oh, tape. I don't know. <laughs> the Quarrymen rehearsals are fascinating in their own way. Mm, well. I mean, yeah, because they do some. I, uh, I I'm relying on memory here, but they do stuff that they did later. They did um, a, I'll one, follow the sun, right? And they did a longer version of it, yeah. right? The one tape, the one tape that is really interesting is the one where they they are playing in the cavern. You know the one I'm talking. You guys know the one I'm talking about, where they're. Um, I can't remember the rehearsal. The yeah, the cat's walk, and I saw her mm-hmm. standing uh-huh. there with the harmonica. Right. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Now that yep. is that is excellent. That is fantastic, and and uh, you know, so I mean, at least we have that. Although, but, uh, although even on that one, there's sort of a big leap from the you know that sort of first idea about what they're going to do with I saw her stand in there to the finished version. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. why they thought the harmonica would be good there. I mean, who knows? It's it's a little bit like a, we were talking a few weeks ago when we were talking about the Pepper Book with all the the lyrics with the crossouts and everything. Mm-hmm. It's a little mm-hmm. bit like that. You know, eeny meeny miny mo and then, uh, crossed out. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? You know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> The, the distance from that original, I saw her standing there to the even to what they did a couple of months later in in Hamburg, which was a lot like what they did on the record. Um, mm-hmm. Well, I think once they dropped the harmonica, that song really took off. Mm-hmm. Um, right. By the way, on the um, Bob Molyneux tape, the the Walton uh, Quarryman tape sold for seventy eight thousand five hundred pounds. Um, which at the time made it the most expensive recording ever sold at auction, and the winning bidder was EMI Records. Uh huh. I con- thought. See, I thought they bought it. <laughs> who considered okay. it for release as part of the anthology project, but chose not to, as the sound quality was substandard. Oh. <laughs> oh, they they Stop. chose not to, and yeah. not the four parties. Well, yeah. <laughs> Stop! But let's not let's not even get into that discussion. I mean, some of the stuff, like I said, on on the first anthology CD was not the greatest, uh, and they did put uh, you know some low qual- quality stuff on there. So, but but not anyway. that low. I mean, consider you know. I don't know when the last time you listened to putting on the style was, or you know, maybe it's been videos, a while. It's, it's been a yeah, while. it's uh, it's very echoey and it's very, you know, it's it's tough going, but you know, it's a lot like it's one of those things where you have to listen to it like seventy times before you can really hear what's going on in there, and a lot of people don't have the patience to do that, but there's. You know, there's a cylinder of Brahms playing a bit of his own music. It's the only recording of Brahms that exists. And it sounds in a certain way like this quarryman tape. I mean, it's you play it, and at first it sounds like just noise, you know? Because mm-hmm. um, it's a cylinder, you know? It's, it's really in bad shape, and it's, you know, the surface noise is incredible. But I had a, a class um, when I was teaching at Juilliard uh, and using recordings to show what we can tell about the way 
performance style changed. And you weren't going to tell much from this Brahms cylinder, but I made them listen to it over and over and over. And by the end, you really could hear what was happening. You know, you just have to focus in on it. Mm -hmm. Um, Well, you know, it's kind of like there are so many early Beatle bootlegs where the quality was poor, mm -hmm. especially a lot of Let It Be stuff. And part of the appeal of that is the fact that it is so low fidelity and you have to listen very carefully to hear everything. Mm -hmm. And some people really like that aspect of it instead of bored quality, everything where, you know, (laughs) you know, you have more of an imagination listening to. The, the low quality bootlegs it really mm-hmm. forces you to listen more even with your headphones on i would say yeah it, it becomes more fascinating you want to hear everything going on maybe a few words of what the beatles were saying to each other you know in the studio you find that fascinating maybe you didn't hear the right word let's play it back again yeah <laughs> you know that kind of thing so some people love that aspect of of bootlegs that are just not the best quality it, it forces you to keep listening over and over again Right, they did. They did put on on the first anthology. They did add "That'll Be the Day," and in spite of all the danger, need, right. neither of which was uh, fantastic, but they but they were somewhat listenable. So they they did do that there. Mm-hmm. So and we're grateful that they that they put it on. Oh well, yeah, no, I'm yeah. I'm just I, we were talking about stuff that they didn't put on, but they did put mm-hmm. that on, right? As well as the the quarryman, the uh, rehearsal tape that we that we had talked about a few minutes ago. So, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it's you know I don't know. I mean, we could get into why didn't they do this kind of stuff all day long? Um, we could we could this is a discussion we could have on many different ideas. Mm-hmm. But uh, and we have, and we have, <laughs> and indeed we have, and we will again. Let it be known that we <laughs> that we will again. Why but, don't we talk about the Lennon McCartney relationship? Well, I mean, are you talking about it in the beginning or or later? I mean, I they work in together. They're songwriting together. You saw you That's saw all sorts of you saw all sorts of articles speculating about how you know how they felt about each other. I mean, I I would. You know, it's uh, I hesitate to. I l- rather let the end product be the, you know, speak for that. They obviously they work together. I mean, whatever differences they had in their personalities, they put aside. They recognized what they had, mm-hmm. and for that, you know, you have to you have to give them a lot of credit. I mean, that could have, I guess, dissolved into a a, a battle of egos, and they. You know, they brushed it aside. I mean, that's probably amazing enough, given the two of them, mm-hmm. given what we know about the two of them today. Mm-hmm. What do you do? You agree with that? Ah, uh, yeah, to a certain degree. I just think that when I think about John and Paul and the songs that were written together, and even Lennon McCartney songs that were written apart from each other, mm-hmm. is the fact that I think the reason why it worked as well as it did is because there was never a set formula to how they did anything. And I think that fit their working styles when it, when it came to music. There's so many different ways they worked together when it came to writing songs. There were songs that they wrote together from scratch where it was 50-50, especially a lot of the early ones from She Loves You to uh, I Want to Hold Your Hand, those kind of songs. There were songs where... It was mainly John's song, and Paul wrote a bit in there, like A Day in the Life, without which that song would be so completely different, but his his contribution was so massive. Likewise, there's a song like She's Leaving Home, which was mainly Paul's song, but John wrote the counter melody, without which, <laughs> you know, it was a massive contribution, and it would be so different without that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there were songs where they both wrote their own bits, and it came together, like... Baby, you're a rich man. Was uh, or I've got a feeling where they they had their own separate songs and they mixed together as one song and that worked well. So and then you've got so many other ways that they collaborated beyond lyrics to melodies. What they added as musicians to each other's songs. So right. you know that's the beauty of it all. I mean, you take a song like. Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes, that was all John's composition, but where would the recording be without 
what was played on the organ at the very beginning from Paul. You know, it's such a key part of the song. There's so many ways that they collaborated, and it went beyond just the songwriting, and that's part of what made it all special. Mm-hmm. 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 I Alan? mean, they had, a, they had a really strong friendship there, especially in the early days, and then they... You know, they, I should, they or really John kind of drifted apart, you know. I mean, John got interested in other stuff. He got bored of what he was doing. And, you know, that that sort of really kind of led to the split, you know. You, you, either you're all committed to a thing like this or you're not. And um, he was... Oh, I, think, I think it was both of them. I don't think it was just John. I, yeah. I, 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 I don't really know. Do. Right to the end, Paul was there trying to pull the band together. Keep it you together. Know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, George had other ideas to Ringo. Ringo, you know, Ringo, I think, would have done what everybody did. I don't think he would have like split uh, apart from obviously during the white album, but that was that was over a specific issue, you know, feeling unloved because Paul was wiping his drum tracks, you know. But you know, the 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 other three, the three songwriters, you know, were they they had their frustrations in the context of that group. And, you know, and it's it's just such a, you know, I I don't know, I have a hard time dealing with like why something like that should happen. I understand intellectually that people grow apart and they grow in different ways and they get interested in different things. But, um, you know, last week I gave a talk up here at Bowdoin College, um, which is in Brunswick, Maine. It's like 35 minutes from Portland. And I was, we did it as an interview where the other person on stage was a really great composer named Derek Burmell. And Derek is a bit younger, but, you know, he loves the Beatles, and uh, he knew a lot of stuff. And we just had sort of a a freewheeling chat, and I played some outtakes of Strawberry Fields and the individual tracks of I Want to Hold Your Hand. and, And, you know, but before we went on, Derek was saying, you know... I find the Beatles story in in a certain way extremely sad. And I knew exactly what he meant because, you know, most of it is incredibly joyous. But, you know, what I think he meant is that you put on side two of Abbey Road and you listen to the end and you listen to the playing and the musical dialogue and just how tight it was and how incredible that side of that last album is that they made as their last album. They knew that it was their last album. And you think, you know, why? Why does it have to be their last album? This is ridiculous. This is like they've achieved a level of perfection and simply could not hold it together. So I I think that's what Derek meant when he said it's kind of sad because like that aspect of it really is. Well, it all depends on how you look at it because – you know, someone like myself, I've been as supportive as you can possibly be where the solo careers are concerned. And I think that the four of them really enjoyed putting out the solo music that they did. And I think it shows in a lot of their music. Hmm. So I can appreciate what each of the four of them have done on their own. And I'm sure that in so many ways, I mean, listen to All Things Must Pass. And I'm like that had the Beatles continued and kept the same formula of George Harrison having two songs per album, that would never have come out. You know, so we should be grateful for the fact that more music came out by them individually, more than we ever would have had if it was strictly the group. But, you know, that's a whole other issue altogether. And, um, you know, the other thing that I wanted to say, and this doesn't take away from the Lennon-McCartney partnership, but even early on, John and Paul were extremely talented as songwriters. There are early examples, like I always, I always praise Ask Me Why, because I think that's a great early song. And that was largely John's song, or a song like All My Lovin', which was you know, mainly Paul's song. And even in those early years, they could write songs completely by themselves. They were complete talents on their own, and at the same time, they really helped each other on each other's songs, and there are those examples of songs they wrote from scratch together. Mm-hmm. But that was that's part of why I appreciate and admire the four of them, is that they're all complete talents unto themselves, 
not just great as a band, I'll never take away anything from how great they were as a band, but even if you go back to these early songs, they had signs of brilliance back then just by themselves. So, you know, that's what was so great about John and Paul, one of the many things. They were great together, they're great by themselves. They were great when they wrote individual songs in the Beatles. I mean, to me, Julia is one of the most brilliant. I know I'm probably one of the few people that would even say that. I think Julia is one of the most beautiful pieces of work on, on Beatles albums. And it only had one Beatle on it, period. You know, mm-hmm. And it's, you've got examples of those, and you've got great examples of them collaborating together. Whether it's the collaboration of John and Paul or all four of them together, it's wonderful to appreciate that. And it's also wonderful to appreciate their individual talents when they were together and on their own. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I still agree, disagree a little bit, Alan, with the fact that uh, I think Paul did be, start becoming an individual earlier than you probably were. You know, even though, you, like you say, he, he tried to hold the group together later on, I, I there was an individu- in individuality happening between both of them and it, and it may have been because they knew how good they were mm-hmm. um, so I, I, I do think I, I'm not saying that caused the group to split up but I'm you know I mean it's just a natural order of things I mean if you're that famous and you're getting that much praise you know you're going to think you're good um, yeah. And, and well yeah around like 66 like uh, they they were beginning to get interested in different things, and Paul got interested in theater and in, in avant-garde classical music and things like that. But but what he would do is he would bring it back to the group. He would come to John and say, listen to this stuff I'm listening to, you know? <laughs> Whereas John sort of felt like, I kind of think I want to go off and do this with Yoko now, you know? <laughs> and also, in terms of, you know, what Ken was saying, um, you know, I I, I think... Before they actually broke up, we kind of were prepared for the possibility of solo careers happening even while the Beatles continued. Oh, because, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, because John mm. put out Live Peace in Toronto, and the Beatles were still a going concern at the time, and it was great to have that, and, you know... But, you know, it, 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 it was very possible. Oh, uh, Wonderwall came out. Um, you know, Paul did, okay, it wasn't the biggest thing, but he did uh, the soundtrack. The Family Way. The Family Way, yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, there was always the possibility that maybe they could wander off and get some solo things done that, you know, would be different from what they would do with the Beatles, but then still come back and be like that synergy of four incredible influences all in one mm-hmm. um, so i guess that's yeah right and and they really didn't you know i i i guess you could say that all things was past was kind of the starting point for the direction for the real direction of the solo careers because up until that point you'd had wonderwall you'd had ringo doing uh you know country music uh um Life sentimental with the lions, journey. of course. Life with the lions. Life with the lions. Mm. Right. They really didn't. They really didn't go, you know, into a excuse me, a very strict solo path until all things must pass. Until George said, "Hey, I've got these songs. I want to. I want to put them out, you know, under my name, and I want to, uh, you know, make use of them." I, I mean, you well, have Mac- you have McCartney doing McCartney, of course, but that's when things really took hold um, yeah. at that. point. Well, so. the first McCartney album was actually very successful, and it did go to number one right. here in the U.S. And that was, you know, that was one uh, April of uh, 1970, mm-hmm. around then. So that was long before all things must pass. But the albums that, that John and George put out while they were still in the Beatles were not pop albums. They were either the avant-garde stuff that, that uh, John and Yoko were doing and, and George with electronic sound – or the soundtrack music of Wonderwall and with Paul with the Family Way, they weren't a pop. They weren't pop albums. Mm-hmm. So apart, apart I think it's really one of Plastic Live Peace in Toronto. Right, half okay. a pop, half a pop album. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and then Plastic Ono Band came out at the same time as All Things Must Pass. I I still 
hold to saying that although yes mccartney did put out the the solo album and and yeah they did say they were going to break up i think the the real direction of the solo careers started pretty much with with all things must pass rather than mccartney mccartney was was kind of a uh uh something he'd been working on the side kind of a throw out there where all things must pass was was really planned um you know, and he put a lot of work into that. Not that McCartney didn't put a lot of work into. But you know, either of those, McCart- either of those records could have been done with the Beatles, and a number of the <laughs> songs on both of those records were tried during Let It Be period. And, and right, and, you think you think All Things Must Pass three record that three record set could have been done with the Beatles? Well, the I'm Beatles, not, the Beatles well, wouldn't have. I mean. <laughs> Right, but but I, a lot of those songs got tried during the Let oh, Be no, sessions, yeah. and you know if sure. they had only if they had only decided to pay more attention to George and you know mm-hmm. do the work that would have been required, you know, to make George to to, to polish up those songs and and do them and then move on right. to their own and not you know uh, because right. it was you know that period was all um, as George might say, I me mine. Right. You know. How many? How many? How many authors have taken those early solo songs and made what if albums out of them? Mm. Um, several have. Mm-hmm. Several have. I've never, you know, I've never, and I think I've said this before, that I've never considered them any kind of Beatles solo albums. But you know, on that res- in that respect, you know, there are a lot of what if albums have been created that yeah. way. Yeah. It's also it's also wrong to assume. That had the Beatles recorded those very same songs, that they would have came out better than how they came out on the solo albums. I mean, I really think All Things Must Pass, you can't touch that album. And I know a lot of people are, are not fond of Phil Spector's productions. I wouldn't change a thing the way that All Things Must Pass was produced. I think you could pretty well imagine they would have come out differently. Yeah. The Definitely. question the question is how different how much differently they would have sounded. That would be the that would be the thing. And mm. unfortunately we'll never find out. I mean we yeah. have we have a couple of the the of the George Harrison songs like you said in the Let It Be sessions, a couple of the McCartney songs in the Let It Be sessions, but the solo versions, you know, I mean are more developed. They're they're, you know, so well, I'm quite happy with the way they came out. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm I'm not I'm not arguing that the the Beatle versions are better. In fact, the Let It Be session versions are are rough. That's mm-hmm. you know, that's the thing. Well, yeah. So, but they're not fully developed, that's all. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. So, but we'll never know. Mm. So, I think we've about I extended our limit here, haven't we? Mm-hmm. We've reached. Our, have we reached our limit? Yes, um, we have. Yes, we have. Um, you can get a hold of us at. Uh, you can write us at things we said today radio show at gmail dot com. We have a page on Facebook. We have a page on uh, our. Uh, we have uh, a Twitter account. Things we said fab. And do you know what I discovered the other night, Ken? What I discovered the other night was I had I had forgotten. We have some of our earliest shows, are like our first dozen, uh, two dozen shows on archive.org. I, I, put I them, didn't know that. I put them there. Okay. I put them there. So our fir- I think it's like our first 24 shows are there, including the uh, the Magical Mystery Tour show that uh, <laughs> the Al about during during when we were talking about uh, mm. our, great, our greatest shows, but that one is there because I listened to it the other day for the is first time. Is that one of our? Is that one of our greatest shows? <laughs> well, that's the, that's one of the ones that that uh, that we were talking about when we were doing the anniversary show as oh. our most memorable. But, memorable, uh, maybe fiftieth anyway. anniversary <laughs> of Magical Mystery Tours coming up. You know, um, you know, we may have to do a oh, remake. My. We may have to do a remake. <laughs> may have to do a remake on that one. They'll probably say but, the exact same things that we said uh, probably, five years ago. <laughs> probably, probably. But, all, but yeah, there's uh, some of those are there. I know not all of them are on Podbean. Um, some of the very early ones, because back in the beginning when we started our account, we had a, um, we had a, a limit. We don't have that anymore. So eventually I may put some of them back on Podbean, put, put them all back on Podbean, but they'll be out of order. But... Uh, they're on archive.org, which is a great resource, by the way. If you don't know what archive.org is, it has 
public domain um, books, public domain pictures. It even has, and thank goodness for this, because the Grateful Dead allowed taping a ton of Grateful Dead concerts. And I mean a ton. Hmm. So that's a, a good place. And, and they're all there legally because the, the dead allowed them to be taped. But anyway, getting back to us, you can find me on my own Facebook page. And I also have a Beatles news and information group on Facebook that you are welcome to join. And we will talk about uh, Beatle issues and post all sorts of things. Um, um, Ken? If you want to get in touch with me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page under Ken Michaels, and my website is kenmichaelsradio.com. Every single week, there's Beatles trivia on there, and you could win one of nine great prizes. And I just want to make a quick mention that for those of you who have never heard my syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, there's a very easy way that you can listen, because... I think almost all of my shows have been archived on the website called GlobalTexanChronicles.com. This is a website, a music website based out of Germany that a friend of mine runs. And you click on the name Ken Michaels right there, and you can listen to all of my shows. And you get a taste of this other program that I've been doing for, well, 35 years. It's a music show with Beatles solo themes... There's trivia in there, too. If you want to know what my other show is like, just go to globaltexanchronicles.com. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Alan? Okay, um, the easiest way to get in touch with me is on Facebook, where, where I exist as both Alan Cozen and Alan Cozen Remixed. Is that your is that your uh, superhero? Uh, yeah. Well, identity? actually, um, actually, um, when when got that something came out, Paula started Ellen Cozen remixed as my friendly page, as opposed to my New York Times persona page, which presumably mm. is unfriendly. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, really? Okay. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, and and then I just kept it, uh, and uh, you know I. I I mess around there, and it's more you know Beatles related when I do anything there at all. And um, and the other one is just my sort of regular you know work work page. Work page, so, yeah. Put okay. my stories okay. up, stuff like that. Okay. All of us except Ken have Twitter accounts. Do we all oh, have five point one surround? <laughs> no. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Very good. That, that's a good one. That's a good. That's a good line. All right. Anyway, for Ken Michaels and Alan Cozen, this is Steve Marinucci for things we said today. Saying thanks for listening and come back next week. Or yeah, we'll see you again sometime next time. That was smooth. 